lived in Los Angeles, worked for a record label in Hollywood, kind of a dream come true. Um, married someone in the industry, had two kids. And my older one, um, because he was my firstborn, was developing slower, and and I just thought, oh, he's like his dad, he's an artist, you know, he's on his own time frame. <laughs> and I didn't know, and a lot of LA moms were telling me that he was behind, but I thought they were just being pretentious because it was LA, and I wasn't really too worried about it. And then when I had my second child and saw how fast he was doing things, I was like, oh, maybe there's something going on here. Um, you know, he would kind of fall over a lot, and. He was slow to talk, he was, um, but all the pediatricians that we saw, they would all say, oh, they all catch up at three. Boys develop slower, they all hit at three, don't worry about it. Just kept telling me not to worry about it. I even had a pediatrician that said, well, he'll probably never be a track star, but he'll be fine. So, um, so I waited until he was three, because that's what I was told to do. And then I took him in, finally got somebody to listen to me, and put him into a clinic to look at him. And by this point, I was kind of searching around and, and thinking maybe autism, right? Because he, he had global delays, and he still wasn't speaking at three. Um, they told me, if he doesn't walk by two, let us know. But he walked like a week before he turned two. So we just kept hitting the milestones just in the very nick of time. So in this clinic, um, they were testing him for autism, and I was already doing all kinds of research trying to figure out if that's what was going on. He had sensory integration, so he seemed to fit the bill. And a PT saw him get up off the floor, and they came in and asked if they could do a blood test, but they didn't really specify what for. So I said, sure. So. We went home, and I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew something was going on. It was really hard to get someone to take me seriously. Um, so we went back, a we got called back in a week later. And um, the neurologist said, your son has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And that is a progressive muscle disorder, and it runs in families. Does anybody in your family have it? And I said, no. My, my dad's a football coach, we're like super athletic people, that's just not possible. He said, well, that's what he's got. Um, and he said, so, you know, there, there isn't anything I can offer at this time. You, he's going to slowly progress, it's a muscle weakness disorder. He's going to probably stop walking between eight and 10 and go into a wheelchair. Then his upper arms are going to go, and eventually his heart and lungs are going to go. You're going to probably lose them between 12 and 20. Uh, we don't have any treatments. We don't have anything we can do. You just need to go home and love him. And by the way, he is mentally retarded, because they used that language back then, and said, so I wouldn't worry about school. I would just really try to give him the quality of life, because you're not going to have it for very long. By the way, one-year-old who I had you bring to this appointment for some unknown reason um, needs to get tested because he probably has it too. And that's literally how this is all delivered. So I know we've heard quite a few stories about sensitivity, about saying there's no answers. Well, they kind of told that to the wrong person. Um, I am not someone that's real good at taking no for an answer. So, um, I went home, I drank a ton of wine, people brought food over as if someone had died, and then I got myself together and I got online. And um, I remember I reached out to Pat Furlong, who was the head of parent project with muscular dystrophy, and she called me back in five minutes, and I was on my road to figuring it out. I went to several geneticists and said, I need the gene sequenced. And they said, well, we don't really do that. And so I pushed and pushed, we found a place that would do it, and it came back inconclusive. And she kept saying, why do you want this information? There are no treatments. Well, I had already heard that there's three different types of genetic mistakes categories that he could be in. And I had already heard that one of the rarest categories had a little bit of research going on. So I was like, well, I know differently, and I know that I need this information so I can at least watch for research and watch for treatments coming. So you don't need to know that. And she fought me and fought me. And so I basically had to threaten, um, and she 
got me another task and it came back inconclusive. And I kept hearing the more times it comes back inconclusive, the higher odds are that you have the rare one. And that was the one they were doing the research in. So I finally got City of Hope. This was back before they were really doing sequencing. I got City of Hope to do it. I got it sequenced. He did. He turned out to have this particular type called a stop codon. I found out the scientist that was working on it. I kind of stopped him a little bit. <laughs> um, I flew to Philadelphia and introduced myself. And sure enough, my son ended up patient number one in the first ever clinical trial for Bishop. So during those years, I left Hollywood because I, well, I got fired, actually at the Grammys, because I couldn't do my job anymore because I was crazy. <laughs> and um, I was going all over to try to figure all this out. So I got let go, so we moved to Arizona because it was less expensive and I could focus on that. And I ended up going back to school and went in a completely different direction. When he started into school, he had no support, nobody would listen, it was the same thing over and over, the fighting, he was in a clinical trial, so he had to fly to Utah for six weeks. I had to figure out how to make that happen. It was a really, really challenging time in our life, and it did turn out that my one-year-old did not have it, so that was, that was good. But it was a lot. It was a lot. So I went back to school and got my master's in educational psychology and I got another master's in behavior because he was actually on the spectrum. About a third of the boys who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy are on the spectrum. So, uh, and nobody knew how to help him. And I remember this behaviorist came over and taught me how to take care of my son. Changed my whole life. So I kind of started on this path like, I don't know what to do with this. I felt very sorry for myself. I felt very sorry for him. And I thought, well, you know, I can feel sorry for myself and or I could go out and learn how to help other parents and other families who aren't as big of a mouth as I am, who aren't as tenacious as I am. Um, and so that's what I did. I went back to school, I got my master's and I started working for the Department of Education, managing disputes between families and school districts. I was a special um, education director. I was a behaviorist. I've done, I teach at ASU, um, the teacher's college. So then I started working because we didn't have any treatments. We had this one treatment that my son was on. We didn't know if it's going to work or not. It did help a little bit. He did not go into a chair until he was 14, which was pretty late. We did delay all of that. And last week he turned 25. form every year when he was in middle school I would always tell my boys okay you can choose between a party or a big present and my younger one would always go for the big present <laughs> and Anthony uh, my son with Duchenne would always say I'm on the party so when you're in middle school I said so what is it this year is it a party or a big present he said mom I want a love fest and that sounded kind of scary to me because he's in middle school. I was like, what's that, buddy? And um, he was like, it's where everybody that loves me comes over and tells me why. And so every year we've done a love fest ever since. And um, this year was Love Fest 25 last weekend. So. Um, so now, fast forward, I work in a national capacity. I still do the education stuff for Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. I work with families and I help, you know, them navigate the systems. I've worked in the Arizona healthcare system, helping um, families get on Medicaid waiver to make sure that they're getting the coverages that they need. Um, I have been um, a part of developing the neuromuscular clinic at Phoenix Children's Hospital, and now I'm working on a transition program at St. Joseph's because our boys never lived past 20, so we don't have any adult care. And when I say none, I mean none. I have to go to the ER for a UTI. It's um, kind of crazy, and a lot of people don't know because it's a rare disease, so I am the one that has to tell the ER doctor what tests to run and what to do. I get national people on the phone, so when we have providers that are a little out of their depth, if they can be humble, like we've talked about today, um, no problem, because we're collaborating. You're an expert in your area, I'm an expert in Duchenne and my son. 
And so I'm going to coordinate the care, and we're going to get a national expert on the phone. You two are going to have a conversation, and we're going to figure out what we need to do. And so that's been working, although I'm working on helping to develop more, more you know, comprehensive care for our adults. We have about 70 families that I'm aware of in Arizona that have young men with Duchenne. So um, we definitely need a care system. So I work for a foundation now called Little Hercules, and we just got our first gene therapy treatment for Duchenne. And so I'm now helping get that covered nationally. So um, whoever thought that our best payer would be Medicaid, that's kind of funny. But our treatments are you know, millions of dollars now, so we have a lot of complicated ethical questions, complicated questions about getting things paid for, and I'm excited to be smack dab in the middle of it all. So I just felt like, you know, we get, we all get dealt cards that we don't know we're going to get dealt. If it doesn't happen now, it's going to happen at some point throughout our lives. I'm certain of it. And I just felt very strongly that I was, what was that amazing quote that you said? That is why I potentially am here is because at least what I can do with our story you know, I may have Anthony for another week. I may have him for another five years. I literally don't know every day. And I know it's cliche, people say every day is a gift and any of us could go at any time, but I literally live that every single day. But I'll tell you, my guy, he can't move his arms, he can't feed himself, he can still play video games, which is really important. Um, but he's happy about 90% 90, 90 of the time happy, really happy, and having a great day. And I don't know if it's going to be next week or if it's going to be in five years, but I do know that I am going to stay and help the people navigate this who don't know how, because if I don't share the wisdom that I've earned um, and share what people did to help me and pass it down to me, then um, it just doesn't justify what we've had to go through. So that's it.